What up, Gripsters and random YouTubers? Evan here for Grips.com with the final bonus part of my Sunday Supersonic hand history review. Final table hand history review with all whole cards revealed. Yep, you heard it right. We're going to see everything that everybody had. I'm going to go through each hand and go through my thoughts as to how I would have played the hand if I were in their situation and also do my best to try to understand why they did what they did in situations where players play a bit more, you know, unorthodox. We're going to get a bunch of confirmation as to whether or not the plays we made earlier in the series were correct. And I think you guys are going to get your minds blown in multiple spots because there is a lot of advanced play going on at this final table. So let's get this party started, shall we? So this hand history review I got from K Alley Poker TV. That's a really great YouTube channel that saves most of the hand histories from the big poker stars final table. So if you guys want to review your play, this is a fantastic learning tool, fantastic channel to uh, be subscribed to and to get information from. So here in Lucky Dan Ace's spot with five big blinds, this is gonna be a profitable shove with nine eight suited. Uh, Lucky Dan Ace though decides that he just wants to limp in and see a flop and H Nevis, who we'll see is very aggressive on this final table is saying, uh, nah bruh. No free flops for you. Next hand, we see a couple of ace kings in the mix. So I think it should be pretty, pretty predictable what's going to happen here. Expect both these players to get all in with their ace kings. Uh, Lucky Dan Ace has a slight advantage with the bigger spade, but most of the time we're just going to be seeing a chop pot in this situation. And nothing to see here, folks. Nothing to see here. All right, this hand, everyone seems to have been dealt some pretty raggy hands. Um, but given the chip stack that H. Nevis has, he can really put a lot of pressure on the other players, and so it's a great spot for him to open. He opts to open shove, and I'm really curious. Let's take a look at that hand in ICMizer. All right, so we pasted the hand history in, and we're just going over to button here to see what button can shove and under normal chip ev circumstances we see that the button should not be shoving king five offsuit here but because h nevis is the chip leader and he's attacking one of the medium sized stacks in the big blind he can actually shove very wide simply because the player in the big blind can't call uh, so let's switch this over to icm ev and uh, calculate that equilibrium again and see how it shifts. And we see now that the button should be pushing any two cards. Pretty much. Pretty much any two cards. Um, and this is the power of the payout structure. And when ICM is in play, um, we see that ranges are very different. So let's calculate it one more time with the chip EV. And we see that the button should be open shoving 18% of hands. However, when we're looking at ICM, the button can shove any two. So nice play there by H Nevis. All right, so here we have a really interesting spot that we reviewed in part five of the hand history review where Lucky Dan's got a spot where he's got to shove with ace deuce suited. He's got four and a half big blinds. If he doesn't take this spot, he's gonna lose about half his chips when he goes through the blinds and antes, and he'll have to double up just to get back to where he was. So his shove is easy, but Yu Yu snap calls with king queen suited, and it's actually quite interesting. Because had it been folded to him, it's a great spot for Yu Yu to go all in. But facing a shove ahead, despite the fact that he's one of the shorter stacks, ICM dictates that perhaps it should be a fold. Uh, we looked at that very in depth in part five. So if you want more analysis on that, check out part five of the hand history review. Um, if I was in UU's shoes, given that I'm the short stack, I'm probably going to be calling with King Queen suited there, but it's just interesting to see that the math differs. And here was a spot where I was curious if I should defend with King eight or not. And given that my opponent had Queen four offsuit, 
I probably should have. And we're going to see that H. Nevis is really using the power of his chip lead to play much wider ranges than he normally would if it wasn't, say, a final table. Uh, I'll also note that because I was one of the shorter stacks and, you know, wanted to survive more in the tournament, um, it made sense to attack my big blind. And we see Blue Tom here is doing what H. Nevis was doing in an earlier hand and just using the power of um, ICM to put pressure on the other players and say, you know, you guys need an extremely good hand to call me here, so I'm going to go all in. So here's an interesting spot. Well, we ran the numbers, and Redul can profitably shove here. Queen 10 suited on six blinds. You can't fault the guy for making the play. He definitely saved Blue Tom some chips, um, because Blue Tom definitely would have opened with Ace-8 there. Hopefully not open shoved, because <laughs> that would be what we call ICM suicide, where, you know, he runs it against the big stack, and he was guaranteed to get a huge pay jump, but he didn't get it. Um, and H. Nevis has an easy call with pocket tens here. Unlucky for him, he doesn't hold up, and Redul doubles through. And that changes things. I'm giving everyone, giving three guys even stacks, and wow! H. Nevis had king-queen suited here. So if Blue Tom hadn't shoved the sevens, H. Nevis would have been all in with king-queen suited, and Redul would have called with nines. And we see what I was talking about earlier, where by staying out of harm's way, you know, Coolers can happen, setups can happen, and players can get eliminated. And we see that if Blue Tom had opted to fold his sevens instead of jamming, um, H. Neves would have eliminated Redul, and we would have had a different winner for this event. So Lucky Dan Ace moves all in here with Ace-10. And I'm, I'm curious about this fold by H. Neves. The problem with calling and losing here is he loses all his you know, maneuverability. He becomes one of the shorter stacks and has a lot less play. And because he's clearly in second, he wants to avoid variance in this spot. Um, he just wants to maintain his second place stack. Us being in fourth place and having a pretty decent hand in the big blind, we have to call off. We, we ran through the numbers with that in ICMizer in part five, but I'm actually curious what ICMizer says about H. Nevi's spot with King Queen suited there. So let's check it out. So I've pasted the hand into ICMizer and we have under the gun shoving for six big blinds. And we're gonna calculate the Nash equilibrium to both see that our call with Ace-9 is profitable, but we're mostly curious to see what it says about what the button should do. So maybe I have to go um, no action here. Or let's let's type in the call and then calculate Nash equilibrium to see what hands he should be calling. So to do this, to make this calculation, we have to switch ourselves from being the big blind to being the player on the button that we're curious about. And then after making that change, we can calculate Nash equilibrium to see what hands we should call, um, what hands we could profitably call with. And we see that king queen suited is actually profitable uh, for one big blind and change. But you notice up here, this is looking at chip EV and we want to look at ICM EV. So let's switch that to ICM dollars and see if it's still a profitable call with King Queen suited. Let's calculate the Nash equilibrium. You see that it drops a lot to 6.3% and according to Nash equilibrium, King Queen suited is a correct fold. H. Nevis made a correct fold with King Queen suited here. And we see that H. Nevis is definitely very aware of ICM. So pay attention to him if you want to see kind of how to adjust your play on final tables when you have a lead on other players and you can use ICM to your favor. All right, so on this hand, we see Radul is just using his chip lead. He's in first place. Um, he's not going to get called very often. And even if he does, he's only risking about five big blinds here. Um, so it's a very low risk for him, and his reward if we both fold is like over two big blinds. So he's at worst risking five big blinds, and he's picking up two. So that's an easy 370k for him. This spot looks like a profitable shove for Lucky Dan Ace, despite the fact that he's up against it. But based on what we saw earlier, maybe he's just going to limp in and fold. This spot is extremely similar to the one earlier where he had 9-8 suited blind versus blind, except at this point, he's down to the final four, so he's got more money locked up, so he has less to lose. And we see that Lucky Danes folds again. He must have really wanted to get those pay jumps, 
And seeing that, you know, Senor Pokes over there only had two big blinds and was going to be all in in a couple hands, he said, all right, maybe I can wait him out and, you know, make an extra $8,000 or so. So we go all in with our King-5 suited. Redul's priced in with nine deuce, makes the call, and lucky for us, we double up. Uh, this hand looks like it's going to be two folds and then a shove from Redul. H. Nevis can't go as nuts as he was going earlier because he's no longer in first place. He no longer covers his opponents, and therefore he has more to lose by tangling with the other big stack. Um, really important concept on final tables that when you're playing against pots or there's a potential to play against pots, uh, against players who have you covered, you want to be very selective of the hands you play because you do not, I mean, you don't want to get eliminated earlier than you should. Uh, H. Nevis is in second place right now. So his goal in the tournament should be to finish, you know, at least top two. And by only battling against players who he has covered, he guarantees that he won't be eliminated. But every time he opens himself up to playing against a player who has him covered, he opens, you know, the door to that possibility of him being eliminated prematurely, um, as we saw earlier with the player who went broke with sevens. So good shove here by H. Nevis gets it through, and, and now Lucky Dan Ace is the one feeling the pressure. Um, but even though there's a player who, you know, is very soon to be eliminated, that doesn't mean we can justify folding premium hands, like King-10 suited on the button. Odds are that the players in the blinds are not going to have a strong hand, and even when they do, you know, we can hold up. Yes, we put ourselves at the risk of elimination, but, you know, we're not just trying to get third place money. We're doing what we can to try to get the biggest payout possible with our chip stack. And this is a spot where <laughs> he knows he's getting called, but he's got an ace, so he should probably run it. Now, the difference is, and you see me saying, can we make a deal, guys? Can we please make a deal? <laughs> um, I think that the spot earlier where he had 9-10 suited blind versus blind, or the spot earlier where he had 9-8 suited, are much better spots because he had fold equity. There's a chance if he shoved in those spots that his opponents would just fold and he'd pick up the pot. Whereas there, he was guaranteed to get called, and he didn't even have that good a hand. This rag is not that good. And here he's, oh nice, Redul actually had it, because we ran ICM Iser in part five of the review and saw that King five uh, was ahead of his shoving range, but seeing that he had pocket sevens there makes me feel even better about the fold that I made there. Obviously, we don't have that information in the moment. That's the best we can do. Okay, so Lucky Dan had nine deuce here. I think he's still supposed to call given the odds he's getting. Let's run Let's run the numbers. All right, so he has nine two offsuit. And we're shoving pretty wide. If we're shoving queen three, we're probably shoving about the top 40% of hands. Yeah, we're shoving pretty wide. We're probably shoving the top 40% of hands. So let's calculate that. We see that nine deuce is pretty garbage hand but it still has a 30% chance of winning. Now let's look at the pot odds he's getting. Okay, so it's 500K total uh, for each of our stacks that would be going in the middle. Um, so we have 500 from me, plus there's 160 in the middle, plus 500 from him. So the total pot will be 1.16 million. And he has to call about 300K to play for that. So we divide 300, into 1160 and we see that he needs 26 percent chance of winning to be breaking even mathematically we see that even with a garbage hand like nine deuce he has 30 percent this is why in the review i was saying oh he should he should call with anything i hope he doesn't but he should um given what we've seen earlier on the final table though that lucky dan is really trying to move up the payout structure i can see why even though he was getting correct odds he's like i'm not going to play this spot i'm going to wait for a better hand and some of you who are watching might say, oh, well, like, what about ICM? You know, that changes things, right? Well, given that Lucky Dan is in fourth and his most likely finishing position at this stage is fourth, especially since he's going to have one and a half big blinds if he folds here, um, he should actually be willing to take those close spots to give himself a more likely finishing position than fourth. Um, it's kind of like if he doesn't gamble, he's probably going to get fourth anyway. So he might as well take any gambles that are slightly in his favor. Uh, but Lucky Dan decides not to do that and hits the old tank, tank, tank rank. 
fault button. Okay, here everyone got dealt some rags and Radul said, you know, he could he could raise and use the fact that he's the chip leader. You know, if he shoves here, H. Nevis has to fold King Queen because he's like guaranteed to make money if he just waits for Lucky Dan to bust. So because Radul had everyone covered by so much, uh, it, had he wanted to, he could have just, you know, made a big play there. And I think it would have been fine. Uh, but he opted to take the lower variance approach. And Dan, this is the hand he picked. Queen six. Interesting. I mean, I guess the antis are pretty massive. 40,000 in chips. But you think you'd get a better hand than queen six. Um, even like, I think calling with nine deuce, blind versus blind against me is a better spot than queen six here. But anyway, he shoves. Uh, H. Neve says, I'm ahead of that shoving range. I'm going to isolate. Radul says, well, I think I'm ahead of both your ranges. Plus, I can afford the chips. I can gamble. I cover. So let's go. And then Boom. That was the double elimination that made us like 15 G's and locked us up. 33.7 thousand dollars. Like, I remember just the, the epic feeling when it happened and just being absolutely overwhelmed with emotion because I kind of couldn't believe what had happened. It's, it's pretty crazy to get such a windfall um, just like in such a short time. So we shoved six, seven suited. Uh, it was a a hand that is profitable to shove and Radul at a7, so profitable for him to call. And unfortunately for him, we doubled up. And I just want to show you guys these heads up push fold charts that help with your heads up situations. Basically, these charts, which you can find if you Google heads up Nash equilibrium, uh, will tell you based on the amount of big blinds you have, what hands you can profitably move all in with and what hands you can profitably call with. So we see that last hand, right? We had like six blinds. So we look up seven, six, we were the pusher. We look up seven, six suited. So the green hands are suited. The orange hands are off suit. We have um, six, seven suited. And it says up to 20 blinds we can shove. We had five blinds, which is less than 20. So easy shove. And in his spot, as the caller, he had a7, and it says with a7 against someone who's playing these optimal ranges, you can call with up to 20 blinds as well. So easy call for him. Uh, this is an extremely helpful resource for the late stages, the heads up stages of sit and goes, turbos, and hyper turbo tournaments where the stacks are very shallow and it's absolutely free. Um, you could even print it off and have it beside your computer screen. Um, because you play for so much money when you get to the late stages of the tournament, but stacks are so shallow, uh, it's nice to have this game theory to rely on so you'll know that, you know, worst case, you don't make any mistakes. They're not necessarily the most profitable way to play, but they're unexploitable. You're never going to lose money playing uh, these ranges or this strategy. So Rudol has four is easy shove on the button, and we have 7-3. We see that 7-3 is not on the chart for 10 big blinds. You see, so we look at the pusher and we got seven, three, seven. And we see that, you know, you gotta be down to two and a half blinds to shove with this. But if we'd have seen his cards, we would have wanted to shove because if he has eight, seven off suit, he can only call if he has five blinds or less and he has 10 blinds. So we, we could have squeaked away a little bit of value here if we went for the shove here. High risk, but you know, it's hard to get delta hand heads up. Um, so there is the potential high reward. So sometimes you wanna deviate from the charts, like I said. Um, like here, for example, where he had six, four. He had six, four. And uh, I remember really thinking like, I think this might be the one. I think this is the spot. My intuition's telling me I'm supposed to go for it. And um, let's see. I mean, he shoved eight blinds effective because it's not his stack that matters. It's the shorter stack of the two that matters. So he's shoving about nine blinds. Let's see if six, four offsuit is there for nine blinds for the pusher. Um, four, six, no. So he's deviating from the charts. And let's see where nine, seven suited is for the caller. Seven, nine suited. We see we could call with seven blinds and we add nine. So we're like, ah, it's close. But you know, if we go with the charts, no. But if we saw that Radul, you know, kind of like to deviate from the charts, 
Like he liked to play a bit more looser. If we got an indications from that earlier in the final table, then our adjustment is that we should call wider than the charts. If, however, we saw that Radul is very tight and is probably not shoving as many hands as the chart suggests, then our adjustment is that we should call with fewer hands. And that's kind of how you can start with your heads up Nash equilibrium charts and start with your ICMIs and see what the game theory optimal play is and then adjust your play and adjust your ranges and the hands you use based on the tendencies or style of the opponent you're playing against. So I remember in the moment being like, I really want to call here, but I'm going to play optimal and so I'm not going to do it. Part of it was I didn't want to look like a moron calling with nine high heads up and be wrong. But even if I'd been behind, I still, you know, have, you know, a 40% chance to get there, which is pretty huge. And we saw that Jack Deuce, we folded. He would have had to fold if we shoved. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard to have a calling hand heads up. And that's why sometimes it makes sense to shove even wider than these charts, especially in like small stakes sit and goes. When you're playing against opponents who are not going to be calling correctly, they're definitely not going to be calling enough. Just jam away and see what happens. Worst case, you get called and you have a 33% chance of winning the tournament. It's really not all that bad of a situation. Um, this is the final hand of the tournament. Um, he makes what I believe is a correct shove with 6-10 suited. Let's check the charts just to be sure. He's effectively shoving six blinds, right? Because it's our stack, not his. And we have 1.5 million divided by 250K, uh, six blinds. So let's see where six, six blinds, we got 10, 10, six suited. Wow, you can shove up to 20. Crazy. Why? Probably because A, it's so hard to get a hand you can call with, and B, suited hands are good at sucking out, suited slightly connected. Um, and we have king four on six blinds, so king four offsuit, we see we can call up to nine blinds. Six blinds is less than nine blinds, and so we uh, click the call button and hope to hold. Hold! No, we didn't hold there. Get out of here. Good game, grips. Good game. Well played. Um, and yeah, so that was pretty cool, right? I really enjoyed watching the final table with cards revealed, and I enjoyed that we got to really illustrate firsthand how to adjust your play based on ICM. Because a final table where the big pay jumps are in play is a very unique situation in poker. It's very different from cash game poker. It's very different from the earlier stages of the tournament. And your play should adjust to reflect these new variables that are in the mix, which is the big money payouts that people care about. People care a lot more about survival on average. People care a lot more about survival on the final tables than they do at any other point in their poker career because they want to make that extra money without getting into confrontation. And if you have the chips or you have that killer instinct in you, you can use that to your advantage and lean on these people and attack these people and get more folds than these people than you would under normal situations, normal circumstances. And because the blinds are so big, you're going to be picking up a lot of chips and building your stack very handsomely. So here are the final payouts from the Sunday Supersonic, uh, 250K guaranteed on Poker Stars, which was my biggest online score ever. Uh, congratulations to Redul from Slovenia, who took away 45,000. Uh, very well played final table. There's us in second, saying your pokes, 33.7K. Wow. Oh man, wow, that was really amazing when that happened. Uh, H. Neves from Brazil, who played really well, really used ICM to his advantage. Great performance, third place for 25K. Lucky Dan Ace, who played solid, played pretty tight. He wanted those pay jumps, and as a result, he made an extra $10,000 getting fourth instead of, you know, potentially sixth. Uh, Blue Tom, unlucky with the sevens, got 11000 and we see, you know, if he'd folded and Radul and H. Nevis had battled, you know, he probably would have got something like third or better. So that cooler with sevens cost him, you know, about $14,000.
And that's why, you know, when you're on a final table and you have a valuable stack, you don't necessarily just want to take the shoves. Sometimes you want to think about, you know, what are the odds of getting called? What are my odds of surviving that all in if I do get called? Could I raise less, you know, like make a small raise and not risk my whole stack? And, you know, if I get shoved on, I can, I can cross that bridge when I come to it. Or do I just want to jam in and make sure no one calls me? These are really important things to consider because every decision is so important on the final table. You know, with these pay jumps in play, the, the, the importance of the decisions are magnified and mistakes are that much more pronounced because you have this cash multiplier um, associated with them. Uh, also, congrats to you, you from Lebanon, who got $7,400 for first place. I mean, I mean, for sixth place, a great payout for everyone who made the final table. And that's the beauty of tournaments is if you can make it to the promised land, if you can make it to the final table, you're gonna make a bunch of money no matter where you finish. So, you know, use the skills that you know, use the skills you know, you've know you learned from the MTT strategy guide to make your way to the final table. And then refine your play with programs like ICMizer to really understand all the variables that are at play so that you can both you know, get to the final table with the strong skill set you develop from you know, the GRIPS training and then fine tune your play to factor in these variables of the pay jumps um, because that's, that's what separates the averages from the elites in multi-table tournaments is really the understanding of ICM, independent chip modeling, and how to factor it into your decision making when you're playing for all the money. And so this concludes the final part of my review of my biggest win ever. Um, as you see, $33.7,000, just absolutely incredible. Um, this win really, I think I mentioned it in the part five of the full review where I went through every single hand from the tournament. But this win really gave me a lot of breathing room. It allowed me to relax. It allowed me to just, you know, get in the flow and not think so much about the financials of, of life because I just, I, you know, I got myself all this breathing room. And once I got into that state and I was focusing on things other than money, other than finances, suddenly I was making much better decisions and really good things came as a result of that. So, you know, it's, it's worth giving yourself these shots and then when you get the big payday, just make the most of it. Use this money that you win from your big tournament scores to do something that makes you happy, to do something that you enjoy, to do something that you'll look back on fondly and remember the good times you had um, for me, it was going to the Bahamas and, and learning how to be a Thai massage therapist because I've always been curious about that. I want to have more tools to help people heal and feel better so that they can play better. And, you know, when I look back on that experience, and be like, man, you know, that was such a great trip I had to the Bahamas. I'm so glad I learned these skills. And wow, you know, if it weren't for poker, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I wouldn't have been able to get there. If, however, you take the path of, all right, I won big, I'm going to try to win more and just keep reinvesting into the, the poker machine, the tournament uh, pinball machine of sorts, um, the wins aren't going to seem as pronounced. They're just going to kind of blend in because you're constantly just trying to get more and more and more. And you're not really rewarding yourself. You're not really celebrating your achievements when you get the big payday. So, you know, just looking back and reflecting on this, the most important thing you can do when you get a big payday, a big windfall from putting in a lot of hard work at something, be it poker or being something else where you do a great project, is to reward yourself. Turn that money into something that excites you, something that you've always wanted so you can say, okay, my work was worth it. Because money isn't the thing that we're after. It's the things that we can do with money that we're really seeking, that we're really chasing. So when you get the money, transform it into the thing you want. Don't just leave it as the resource, you know, that it is to try to get more of it. Like do something that makes you feel really special. I'm just harping on this because I've seen too many people uh, win money and then just dump it back to the machine and be unhappy. I've been through this myself where I had big scores and then I just, 
I just chased more and more and more. And so I, I wasn't appreciating what I had. I wasn't thankful and I wasn't doing what I really wanted to be doing. And poker is supposed to facilitate your ability to live the life that you really want to live. It's not supposed to be all consuming and something that you get lost in and never get out of. Man. <laughs> this review is great. It was, it was so much fun making this review, and I hope you had as much fun watching it as I did making it. I also really hope you learned some things from this hand history review that will help you in your future tournaments to make the most of your opportunities when they come around, and just help you make more money so that you can have more fun living the life that you've always wanted to. That's what it's all about facilitating the dream through developing a skill set, applying it, being financially rewarded for our hard work and knowledge, and then transforming those, fi those financial resources into something absolutely beautiful, something incredible. If you'd like to learn more about how to win multi-table tournaments, uh, check out my MTT video strategy guide. It's the best piece of content I've ever put together on multi-table tournaments. 10 part series that will teach you everything you need to know. Big picture thinking, early stage, mid stage, late play, big stack play, short stack play, bubble play, live tournaments, you name it, it's in there. Um, also, if you'd like to watch the full experience live as it happened, uh, check out the my biggest win ever, which is also my favorite YouTube video ever. And um, when you're done with that, please leave me a comment below this video uh, with your feedback, with your thoughts, what you liked about this series, if you'd like to see more content like this in the future, and anything else you think I might like to hear. Thank you so much for watching this video and sharing this experience with me. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.